You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey everyone, thanks again for hitting that play button for another episode of Dayball's Podcast. Uh, before I get to the interview with David Greenberg, I just want to give a quick shout out to a couple of people and a couple of projects. Uh, my first one I want to talk about is uh, Scott McMahon's new book, How to Make and Sell Your Film. Uh, this is a book that Scott has put together uh, over making his first film, which was called The Cube, which he made for $500. And now he's making his second film, that I'm actually helping to produce. Uh, but still, uh, even though I wasn't involved, I, I would still recommend this book. Uh, Scott basically takes you from the just having the right mindset of a filmmaker all the way until, you know, uh, actually distribute, uh, distribution and also, you know, getting the word out there about your film. And also how you can parlay everything you've learned into the next project so everything always becomes bigger and better and uh, you know if you really want to support this podcast I ask that there's an affiliate link in the show notes and if you go to that link to actually purchase the book whether it's on Kindle or whether it's the actual physical book or even the audio book you actually go through that affiliate link it actually helps the show out a lot uh, you know it, it just covers a little odds and ends such as you know podcast hosting and, uh, and the like and um, I'm actually working on upgrading a lot of my equipment at the time being but um, again, if you actually go to uh, DaveBullis.com and actually uh, – you can actually find a lot of the old back episodes. So if you want to start all the way at episode four, you can uh, – again, because the first three episodes are considered to be the lost episodes. But you can start all the way at episode four and you can work all the way to the next uh, 50. So – uh, which brings me to my next point. Uh, my book uh, is actually in the process of, of – it's almost done the first draft. Uh, basically what I did was I took the top five interviews that I've done and the, how I based that upon was not only just downloads but also plays and also the amount of times it was shared on social media. So the top five people are all going to be in this book. And I'm going to end up doing a sort of teleconference with all of them at the same time. So it'll be six of us. Uh, excuse me, seven. And uh, the reason is uh, one of the episodes has had two guests on it, which were the Walking Fool uh, documentary, which was Marky Phillips and John Mazalowski. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up uh, – in the very near future, actually having a teleconference with them, we can uh, get updates from everybody, and we can also, you know, just see what they've learned and, and see how everything's changed since their podcast interview. And the book should be in the Kindle store, I'm hoping, by the end of next month. There's a few things I want to change in there, and a few things I want to just make sure to improve upon. And the book, by the way, is going to be uh, 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 the Kindle version is going to be 99 cents. So it's not going to be a big investment from anybody, and I am going to look into getting physical copies. I know a couple people have actually emailed me and asked about that. So, yeah, I will definitely look into getting the physical copies made, uh, like a print-on-demand through Amazon and their SendSpace um, uh, platform. So... Uh, again, everyone, I want to say thank you very much for listening. Uh, the interview with David Greenberg is phenomenal. David Greenberg has been in the business for 20-some years, 30-some years. Uh, so I want to get talking to him. Uh, so, again, if you can, everyone, please you know, uh, rate and subscribe the podcast on iTunes. It is so important uh, because as I reach out to more and more guests, uh, that's one of the analytics that's actually very important is actually the subscription rate and the number of rates it has and also in the iTunes analytics it's also big too so uh, if you've done it already thank you very much and um, alright let's go on to the interview with David thank you very much you're listening to the Dave Willis Podcast Joining me on 
the podcast today is David Greenberg. David Greenberg has been a, uh, writing screenplays professionally since the n- early 1990s, incorporated as assembly finalist for the prestigious Sundance Screenwriters Lab. Uh, his film, The True Meaning of, of Cool, won an award from the American Film Institute. His feature, Stomping Ground, was also shot in 24 hours and currently is in pre-production – I'm sorry, post-production, excuse me. And his documentary, Bonnie and Clyde, Lovers on the Run, is scheduled for a 2015 release. David Greenberg, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dave Bullis. Thanks for asking. <laughs> about yourself? I'm doing pretty good, thank you. Cool. Uh, usually I talk about the weather, whether the person is. Most of the time they're in L.A., but you're basically <laughs> 20 minutes away from me right now. Yeah, something like that. So um, how's the weather in Philadelphia? I don't know. Oh, it's, it's you know, balmy, muggy. It feels like summer. <laughs> Not looking forward to it. Yeah, I um, I have the air conditioning on right now because it was getting way too sticky around here, and I was like, ah, I just got to bite the bullet on this one. I'm trying to be a little bit macho. Uh, I say macho. Other people say cheap and not turn on my AC until June. We'll see how well that works. <laughs> No, I'm going to start using that too. I'm going to start telling people that I'm macho. Yeah, yeah, that goes better. It doesn't really work, but, you know, makes me feel better. See, like when I take a girl out on a date, I can be macho and be <laughs> like, listen, let's just get off the uh, the child's menu. And uh... <laughs> But uh, I, I'm just kidding. No girl wants to go out with me. But um, anyways, so, you know, to get on, um, to go in, to getting into the interview, Dave, so, you know, because if you could, could you just give us a little bit about your background and sort of how you got started in this uh, in this field? Sure. Uh, you know, I – one of my earliest memories – this is going way back. I mean one of my earliest memories is I think my parents taking me to see a Charlie Chaplin film when I was four or five and I, I remember it and – I mean, I think I was, that was probably the first movie I saw in the theaters, and I've been hooked ever since. So as a movie geek as a kid, uh, I bought a – my best friend and I pooled our money together and spent $10 on a used Super 8 camera, made movies running around with that, and – it just the, the typical, I guess, uh, an un, a not uncommon trajectory. Discover. I didn't even know that you could go to college for film till I was sixteen. A, a friend of mine was graduating high school a year before me, and I said, "So what are you doing?" She said, "Oh, I'm going to college to study film." I'm like, "You're what?" So then I was like, "Wow, I can go to college for film. I'm in." So I went to Temple, was a film major there, graduated, um, worked on a couple independent films after college, a uh, big studio film. Uh, I, I guess it's a, a major point in my experience that uh, in production, um, I have the experience of working on the crew of a you know, $1.5 million indie in every position, not getting paid, spending 45 hours on set once, um, finishing that after three or four months on a Saturday, and then the next Monday going to work on a major Hollywood film. So it was, it was a really kind of watershed moment or life-changing Moment, uh, experiencing the study and contrast between a the working on a low budget indie and a major Hollywood film. So that I'd always I had been leaning towards the indie minded stuff for a long time. Uh, at that point, you know the the first film I remember going to with the word independent film in my mind was the Coen Brothers' first film, Blood Simple. I went, I went to the theater thinking, I'm going to see an independent film, even though I'd probably seen independent films before that. So I've always been kind of independently minded. Um, the experience of working in production uh, on two films back to back for, I don't know, whatever it was, six or seven or eight or nine months straight, uh, that's when I decided I wanted to be a screenwriter. I, I, at that point, I worked in every department in production. And I was always writing, but I thought, you know what, screenwriting is what I want to do. You know, it's very cool that you got that experience right out of college. Um, being able to, like, you know, I, I think that's imperative. Being able to get that experience yeah. of just working in various uh, uh, positions, and that way you can actually see sort of how this whole moving, how, how this whole 
big project is a lot of moving parts and what, what you do to add to that. Very much so. Uh, you know, I'll skip ahead just because I know I'll forget it. Uh, very interestingly, not just just a few months ago, I was on a screenwriters or I'm in a producers group on LinkedIn, and somebody posted a question to producers: What's the hardest thing about working with screenwriters? And the most common answer that came up was most screenwriters have very little idea of what goes into the day-to-day nuts and bolts, hands-on production of a film. So they they just write stuff and with with no concept that a a crew is going to have to find a location and put all this stuff together in order to make these scenes happen. Um, I found that pretty fascinating. Yeah, very true, uh, and, and I've noticed you know that as well. Um, you know, I, I've done a, I did a project with the screenwriter one time, and he was a complete neophyte, and he had absolutely no idea you know what it all entailed. Yeah, so, you know, I I I, and I have mixed feelings about, it, but I very much of myself as writing for the producer. I'm very much of the mind that. That a screenplay is a working document that uh, a team of practitioners, craftsmen, needs to pick up, glance at, figure out what needs to be done for their shot, what set needs to be built, what costumes need to be designed or created or sewn, uh, what props need to be there, etc. They don't want to read a book. They want to say, okay, it's a scene in a kitchen. Let's build a kitchen. Let's put stuff in it. So I try to keep my scene descriptions really spare and short and action sequences too. Yeah, and that's a good point too. And, you know, a lot of the times that's all they, you know, and it, it is real. It, it, it is indicative of, of what their job, you know, the job is because I mean, a lot of the times the crew has no idea of really what the movie's about. They just know that there's a kitchen, you know, a kitchen set here. Um, there's this or that, and they sort of get parts of it because a lot of times, in my experience, they don't even get the script. They just sort of get a list of things. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's this is a. Uh, there's deliverables. You have to make a set. You have to, you know. Sometimes you're right. They don't even know what the movie's about. It's build a, build something where we can do this, that kind of thing, or we need a suit of armor, or we need a spaceship, that kind of thing, and they just go off and do it. So uh, sometimes it, it feels strange, but there's I, I was judging a screenplay contest recently, and I came across a number of scripts that I would say were too well written, which seems like a backhanded compliment or a underhanded criticism. <laughs> I'm not sure. But sometimes writers fall in love with their craft and they overwrite. And, you know, so this action sequence that was two pages long, expertly formatted, written, but I thought, you know, that's not how you put it. Right. There's a fight scene. And then the director and the stunt coordinator um, and the fight choreographer pre-visualize it using 3D animation, that kind of stuff. So it's really not the screenwriter's job. It was a waste of pages, I I thought. Yeah, that that is a good point, too. And, you know, you being a a, professional screenwriter and being able to be in a screenwriting competition, which is something I want to touch on a little later, Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, just seeing, you know, how much is too much and how little is too little, and you know, that, that I know what you mean about the some some scenes being overwritten, and it's just you know it's way way too much to actually put into a certain scene or you know without being the script being you know five hundred pages. Exactly. There's a classic case of. Spielberg's film Munich, he hired Tony Kushner to write the screenplay for Munich. Now, Tony Kushner's a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. He's awesome. He'd never written a screenplay before. So there's a 
chase scene in, in Munich, and he wrote every little last detail of the car swerves to the right, it crashes into this car, then bounces off and drives into the other lane, and this and that. And then they brought in Eric Roth, who's an Oscar-winning screenwriter. I think he wrote Forrest Gump, among other things, who you know was going to do the rewrites on. He looked at this, you know, four or five page chasing and said no 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 you just write there's a chase scene <laughs> that you, that yeah, that is how you get it's, it's just so concise to the point yeah yeah there's a, i don't know if you've ever seen the screenplay for alien the first alien yeah i have actually oh, okay yeah so that's famous in screenwriting circles not because it's such a great script but such it's so spare i mean you look at the the page and there's maybe 75 100 words on the page it's just so succinct i mean uh, truth be told maybe a little too succinct but it just totally no frills so yeah. i strive for something close to that yeah dan o'bannon dan o'bannon uh was is i have his book on screenwriting and um i i thought like the way he he did that was very interesting and i also i i i'm just a big fan of his in general Mm -hmm. and even after you read his book on screenwriting and then go back to that Mm -hmm. it's it's even more interesting yeah i actually didn't know he had a book on screenwriting i'm gonna have to check that out yeah it actually came out um about a year or two ago his wife actually like he was writing it for years and Mm -hmm. then he he passed away and then apparently his wife was like i'm just going to publish this and Uh, she she even put in like a lot of the the chapters that he was going to cut and just been like i don't know what he would have wanted so here you go but uh, yeah it's 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 awesome though um i really recommend you check that out i'll even put that in the show notes but um but you know getting back to you know talking about you you know um you know, incorporated, you know, was a semifinalist in the Sundance Screenwriters Lab. Mm-hmm. So, you know, could you take us through that, you know, how you actually wrote that and, you know, and submitting it to the Screenwriters Lab? Sure. Yeah. It's going back uh, quite a few years. Um, it was actually adapted from a short story I had written. And, um, you know, it really, I, I feel like. You've probably heard this before. Write what you know, um, and it's very interesting because this this is a script that has nothing to do with anything I know. Technically, it's set in the corporate world. It's sort of a Kafka esque black comedy about a young man out, fresh out of grad school with his MBA who, who gets his dream job at a huge corporation, and then literally and figuratively loses his identity. Uh, Now, I don't have an MBA. I didn't go to grad school and I'm not in business. And everybody who's read it said, wow, you must have worked in an office for a long time. And no, I never did. Never want to. My goal in life is to not have to wear a tie, suit and tie every day. But it was on another level, it was a very personal thing because back when I went to film school, it was not a very popular choice. There were not, I went to film school. I'm going to date myself here. Uh, I started film school in 1983. This is just heading into the Reagan era, Reaganomics and the whole yuppie craze. And I was seeing kids in college, business age, up to school in suits and ties. And I was thinking, you're really in such a rush to grow up that, you know, you, you, you can't wear a t-shirt and jeans to college or something. And, and what, as like, what did you want to be when you were a little kid? You know, did you want to be a data systems processor, analyst, whatever people in, you know, not, not to disrespect people who go to work in offices and wear suits every day, but, uh, and, and I felt like, People disrespected or mocked those of us who went to film school because it wasn't like a real thing. Uh, Very interestingly, though, 10 years later, 10, 15 years later, I read an article in a film magazine. This was now in the 90s. And obviously there was a huge change starting in the late 80s, early 90s with the indie film boom. Uh, Spike Lee's first film, um, Steven Soderbergh's first film, Tarantino, all those late 80s, early 90s things. Then there was a boom in film schools. So I saw this article once that said film school in the 90s is what business school in the 80s was. Uh, 
So uh, in in that way, uh, Incorporated was very personal to me. And uh, believe it or not, I'm still itching to make it. It was, it was written to be a very, very low budget independent for but I actually had to put it aside because uh, I, 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 I feel mature enough to write. Now, of course, it's really out. Uh, I'm going to have to update it. But, you know, the, the dream is still there to this film. Uh, actually, Dave, could you actually just repeat that last part about you still want to make it? Um, sure. It just uh, you were kind of dropping out there for a second. Uh, okay, sure. So uh, my dream actually is. To, re, to, to, to revisit or incorporate it and make it one day. Uh, you know, we'll get to it in a minute or two or whenever, but, you know, so I finally have you know, 25 years after saying it's what I want to do, I finally made a feature. We'll see what happens with that uh, stomping ground. It might give me the leverage to revisit incorporate it, which will need um, a dramatic rewrite. And updating. So when when you actually entered Incorporated, you know, what did it feel like to actually become a semifinalist? Uh, you know, at the Sunday Screeners Lab. Well, it was awesome. Now, this was, believe it or not, still in the relatively early days of the lab. When I entered it, uh, I think there were only five hundred submissions. Um, of that five hundred, they picked twenty four, and I was one of the twenty four. And of that 24, I picked 12, and I was not one of the 12. But now I'm sure they their the submissions are more like 5,000 a year. But still, um, it was nice to be recognized. Yeah, I actually was told that you know every year all these screenwriting competitions get a slowly get more and more and more entries to the point now where it's like the Nicole gets. Um, Gets a uh, gets a ridiculous amount now of oh, entries. Well, I mean, I think that's the thing too. Everybody it seems like everybody and their grandmother wants to be a screenwriter, and I literally have gotten messages from grandmothers who want to be screenwriters. Um, it's you know, I'm sure there's people out there who still won't write the great American novel, but it seems like everybody wants to write a screenplay. Um, everybody loves movies. Everybody thinks that they can write a screenplay if they see enough movies. It's not really the case. And there's – unfortunately, there's a lot of screenwriting competitions that prey on people's dreams. You know, you mentioned that and, and that's actually a good uh, uh, good thing to bring up is there. if I meet – you know, I've met so many people who just sort of go, "Oh, I could write a screenplay," and mm-hmm. I, I, mean, I mean, they've had no training; they've never even seen a screenplay. Um, case in point: when in about uh, a couple years ago, I was filming a TV pilot, and um, I got into local papers and all Philadelphia, whatever, and. Uh, I had a bunch of friends that I went to high school with chiming me on uh, on Facebook, and immediately it was like, "Hey, you know, I want to. Re- I have a friend of mine. He has a screenplay. Blah blah. This screenplay. That's the, you know, blah blah. This and that." And I was like, "I'm gonna have to shut my Facebook down." But mm-hmm. I, I remember I had a friend of mine who was who oh, I saw like about once a week, and he was like, "Oh, I, I'm gonna start writing a screenplay." He was like, I, "I could definitely do it," and you know, he never did it obviously, but um, because he never took the time to actually try to learn a craft he was just like oh I'll, I'll bang one out in a weekend yeah yeah and you hear about people who do that <clears throat> and the fact is i mean i have the, in in one powerhouse week a few years ago i actually did write two features in one week but it was special circumstances i was under the gun also i was on vacation with no internet or access or tv so i could write like 12 hours a day my thing i, I say a lot is that about screenwriting it's like smoking or drinking or doing drugs it kind of looks cool it might it might look cool from a distance you might think oh that looks cool i want to try it so you try it and you kind of find you like it but then that by the time you find out it's really bad for you it's it's kind of hard to stop <laughs> where i am <laughs> i you know i i i should have quit i feel like i should have quit years ago um in fact i did at one point i said i can't do it I, you know, it's not happening. I try, I'm done. And I actually shut everything down. This was like late 
90s, I think. And I had a friend who had just done his first feature and he encouraged me. He had come to a reading I did of Incorporated and really liked it. He encouraged me to send it to you know his people in L.A. So I sent it and response was really great. People loved it. They said, they said it reminded them of Terry Gilliam's Brazil. And that was the thing. They were like, oh, it's like Brazil. So it was getting – I can't say it was getting buzz, but people were hearing about it. And that was unfortunately all the encouragement I needed. And so now I'm like, ooh, I'll write something else. Ooh, I'll do this. I'll do that. Um, but it, it cooled off for a while. It really heated up again about 10 years ago. Um, I saw the movie Open Water. Did you ever see that? Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, so I remember it came out 2003, 2004. And it was a big – it caused a big sensation at Sundance because it was one of the first films shot on like really lo-fi digital video. And, uh, you know, if I say open water to you, what's what's the first thing that comes to mind for like, your perception of the movie? Uh, it's, you know, in the middle of the ocean with nothing but ocean around them. Right. But do you remember what the marketing hook kind of was? Was it a raft in the middle of the ocean? It was, no, they're, they're scuba divers. The marketing hook was that uh, they used sharks. They're in shark-infested water, and the actors, when you see the actors in the water, it, there's, those are real sharks swimming past them. And oh, that was what people heard. Oh, did you hear about open water? No, what's that? Oh, it's the movie where these people are in the water, and there's real sharks. So people were like, real sharks? I'm going to go see that. And... Um, Movie's 80 minutes long, not especially well shot. I'm sorry if the the filmmakers are listening to this. They can take it up with me later. 80 minutes long. um, You don't even see a shark for the first 35 minutes, which means it's essentially 35 minutes of filler. Um, And it's basically a domestic drama that just happens to be unfolding in the water. I didn't think it was a especially good movie. And I thought, wow, these people made, Oh, I feel so terrible because I I generally try not to trash movies in public, but here I go. I didn't like it. I went people who did like it. So it could just be me there. That's my, my caveat or my whatever. But I thought, okay, these people made a movie for next to nothing, really low fi, not, great script and they had a marketing hook real sharks let's go and i thought that's what i'm gonna do um i didn't set out to make a bad movie but i thought if i make a decent story lo-fi that has a marketing hook maybe i can break in that way yeah and, and that's a good strategy and uh you know um it's not. I mean, you've seen like the movies Buried, uh, mm-hmm. ATM. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm trying to think of another, you know, one location movie. But you know, some of these mo- movies that are shot with just minimal locations in one one spot, pretty much. Well, which so the result of that uh, ten years ago. Yeah, I think it is ten, nine, ten years ago. I wrote Stomping Ground, which is a one location movie. Uh, six characters in real time and that's that's what i got out of open water um and so that's now in post-production along the way i've tried to get paid to write screenplays and and i did pick up a handful of jobs along the way so stomping ground was optioned a couple time so it it wasn't like it totally took me 10 years to get it made because it was out of my hands for almost five years out of those 10 years where different producers had it but along the way i was just going up for job after job um sometimes i got it most of the times i didn't but i got a couple screenwriting jobs so, so then, you know, take us through Stomping Ground. You know, it okay. sort of, you know, give us a if you could, could you please give us a, like a brief synopsis about it? Sure. Stomping Ground is a coming of age thriller about four young buddies, tough urban kids, lifelong buddies who commit a random act of violence, and soon 
very soon find themselves thrust into an increasingly intense series of circumstances that spins further and further out of their control. It's basically a bad situation that continues to get progressively worse. It sets off a chain of events. So I call it uh, Stand By Me meets Mean Streets. And, you know, you shot that around here in Philadelphia, correct? Yeah, it's, it's technically set in Philly at a tough working class neighborhood in Philly. But we actually shot it in Yardley, Pennsylvania, because the producer, the producer's parents live there. And the house, the, the property abuts uh, a park, a forest. So we found that we could have the cast and crew camp out at the house for the weekend wake up, roll out of bed, and be on location. <laughs> it worked you, out really well. You, you can't beat that. You really can't. It was, it was, it was really great. So, you know, uh, you, you made stomping grounds. Now, did you shoot for 24 hours straight? No, we shot two 12-hour days. Basically, well, I can't do the math. <laughs> I don't know. We got up at, I think we were, yeah, basically we shot eight to eight. Um, okay. Saturday and Sunday or Sunday and Monday. It was um, Labor Day weekend, uh, believe it or not, 2013. So it's going on two years since I shot it, and I'm still in post-production. Wrapping up, I think. <laughs> well, I just had meetings today. The, one of the biggest holdups was music and sound. Shooting a movie like that in the woods – Really rushing, no time to take things mm -hmm. carefully. Um, the sound was bad. There were sound issues. And my audio guy was a genius and literally went through every line of the movie, the audio, and cleaned it up, as he said, with a fine tooth comb. Um, my color correction guy, I hired a guy to do color correction, paid him, and um, he sort of gone on AWOL. So I don't know if he finished it. I should, probably shouldn't have paid him first. There's That's a long story. So it looks like I'm going to have to go in and do color correction with my music guy. And um, it, it's been a very long post-production, but I'm hoping to have it finished this summer. You know, that, that's a shame to hear. Um, something like that happened to me once, um, except I hired a guy to do poster art. Mm -hmm. And I paid him a a. We came to an agreement, and I paid him pretty much over half. And um, he, I, I kept saying, you know, where, what can I, when can I see this poster art? I need to see something. And finally, the day came, and um, well, actually, we're way past the day, the the date. And he finally admitted it. He had nothing for me, and he couldn't pay me back my money, the money that I paid him already. <laughs> Yeah, it's a tough thing. It's, 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 you know, like I say, it's like smoking or drinking drugs. It's like, why did I, why did I start doing this? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to stop. But, I, you know, and you, you lose sight. Um, the last time I saw Stomping Ground, I had real, I, I, you know, I watched it and I was like, oh, this stinks. I hate this. This is terrible. What did I do? And then halfway through the movie, I'm like on the edge of my seat. Like, like, like I'm watching it for the first time. Like, like I didn't know what was going to happen. I found myself wrapped up in the story and, and, and in the emotions. I, I, I will admit that I even got a little teary eyed and, and emotional. And I'm like, wait a minute. I know what happens. I wrote it. I directed it. And it was almost like an out of body experience. So I think that if 10 years later and how many other times I've seen the film in progress, if I saw get wrapped up in the story and I still get lost in it, I might be onto something. Yeah, definitely. And that, you know, it's amazing when you're able to, when you're able to be drawn into your own projects like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, one of my first jobs might have been, well, okay. My first paying job as a screenwriter was 1995. Um, I got hired by a record company to adapt a couple of crime, true crime novels <laughs> into screenplay. Um, um, they never got made. They got pitched. One of them got pitched in L.A. Everybody liked it. Nobody bit. Um, it's a shame, but that's, that's how it goes. Then I didn't get another job until for another 10 years. Um, that was 1995. I don't think I got another job till 
a paying job anyway till 2006 and I got hired to write in the producer's terms a lifetime channel style movie uh, chick flick romantic tearjerker which is not exactly my genre but I've really come to realize that if I'm doing seriously if I'm going to be a screenwriter I have to be able to write whatever somebody asks me to write. And, and to this day, um, you know, almost 10 years later, you know, I still cry when the really sad part happens. So it's like I'm like flipping through the pages. And I'm like, I know it's going to be on the next page. I'm going to be like, oh, no, do I really have to read this? It's going to be sad. <laughs> so um, that movie actually did get made. Uh, that might be an interesting topic to touch on because it got made let's see it was shot i wrote it in 2006 it was shot in 2007 i didn't see it until maybe 2012 it had a couple festival runs it's called what matters most um there's another movie from 2001 called what matters most this is not it um might be i i hear it might be available on hulu or something for free anyway it's a all too familiar tale uh, from the time i did my last draft of it to the time it was shot virtually the entire thing changed there's new characters um basically well i'm you know who knows who's going to hear this so i'm not gonna i don't want to burn bridges but it it changed dramatically from what i wrote and um with mixed results let's just say but fair enough yeah. fair enough <laughs> so you know just to touch again really quick on stomping ground you know yeah you actually crowdfunded that on kickstarter i did yeah, yeah. so um you know it just you know, just because you know you you not only started doing screenwriting, but then you started doing producing and directing, you know, and then now you're you had to put on that crowdfunding hat. You know, what are some of the things that you learned during that crowdfunding campaign that you would you that you would use for future campaigns? Um, good question. I'm trying to think. Um, there there's certain secrets or whatever strategies that I'm, I'm not a hundred percent proud of. Um, let's just say, uh, a, you have to be adept with spin, spinning things, um, making things look more exciting, uh, than they might actually be. Let's just say, um, I, you know, so it's a obviously a very social media driven platform, um, and so for a, for the entire month of campaign, I was on social media all day, every day, trying to drop very provocative Facebook posts and tweets and things like that, trying to drum up interest for it. But let, let's just say, you know, I never, I never told a lie but i've gotten very good at presenting alternate versions of the truth <laughs> if that, that's I'm, i know i'm being cryptic and mysterious uh okay you know what i'll just come clean um it was like the day before the the last day of the podcast or not the podcast this is the podcast of the of the social media camp the crowdfunding campaign and i posted on my facebook in all caps i I posted thank you kevin smith thank you edward burns and you know that's all i said and i let people read into it what they would and I think I think over five hundred dollars came in that night because, as I'm, I'm guessing, people thought that Kevin Smith and Edward Burns contributed to my campaign. It's dirty. It's devious. I'm not proud of it, but it worked. <laughs> Fair enough, Dave. Like, um, you know, one thing that you know, I, I'm sure you know, you've learned too, is the pre-launch is so important. Yeah. And, um, 
I mean, like today, I was just talking to Bill Plimpton, um, who's you know two time Oscar nominated yeah. uh, animator, and he he actually has his own crowdfunding campaign right now. Um, by the time this, by the way, by the time this this airs, it's going to be over. But mm. um, but uh, uh, you know, and and uh, we were just discussing, you know, he when he first started, you know, he didn't realize you had to put like the the team he had to put together. So oh, he, yeah. he he was like, you know, he he ended up going to a guy who does you know crowdfunding professionally, mm-hmm. um, just that's all he does, and then just saying like, let's go with the campaign from here. Um, there's a lot. There's a little bit of, of something I've learned from everyone's crowdfunding campaigns. Um, so when the next time I launch one, which I hope will be the end of this year, um, I hope to be able just to – I don't want to say steamroll it, but I mean like it won't be as bumpy as when I – the last time I did it, which was in 2010. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I hope I don't have to do one again, but um, I realize that's the way it goes. So I'm, I'm prepared. I mean, uh, uh, fingers crossed, Stomping Ground attracts enough attention. Uh, somebody wants to make a movie with me and they come to it, uh, come to me with money. I, um, you might have seen on, on our ever-loving social media that I have a couple projects being pitched in Cannes right now at the film festival or the film market there. So I'm waiting to hear about that. These guys might come back to Cannes saying, hey, we have a deal. You have to write these two screenplays and here's the money. Um, Which would be nice. That'd be very cool. That'd be very cool. You never know. Um, But I I did my job. I wrote these pitch packages for these guys. They they told me that one one of the films is – going to be an adaptation of a short screenplay that one of the guys asked me to write. So I wrote a feature length treatment for synopsis of that one. And then they had another idea that they wanted me that, that they wanted to pitch. So I did a synopsis of that. So they're going around can now, um, pitching those and, you know, one of them might get the deal. And I would hope that deal would include, hiring and paying a screenwriter and and i wish you the best of luck dave um Thanks. you know because right now with con i know one of the things everyone's talking about right now is netflix yeah. uh, just made the announcements they're coming to germany um mm-hmm. so now like i know it's, that's sort of some people are crying the death of um of uh of, of film tax credits some uh, along with foreign pre-sales and some people mm-hmm. are saying you know the opposite of that uh it's going to be very interesting to see um yeah. because otherwise you know crowdfunding and then digital distribution maybe even through netflix or well i mean i would prefer my own site like if i was going to make a film de- i mean depending on what's going to happen with it i mean most of the time as i've learned you might be better off just self-distributing it through your own site. And mm-hmm. if you want to pay aggregators like iTunes and go through that whole process, I mean, there's, there's companies that deal with iTunes, you know, uh, uh, exclusively. Yeah. I mean, that's not a bad way to go either, but, but no, I just wanted to mention that. I mean, it is, you know, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing. In some ways it's, it feels very cutting edge and new. In other ways, it feels almost like the old studio system where like, you know, they Netflix, contracts Adam Sandler for four movies and um, Amazon hires Woody Allen to do a TV series that kind of thing it's um, it's it's not traditional distribution because it's all computer based but they're making deals with people like that I I find it very fascinating I am uh, I'm developing a TV product for a producer who has some connections at both Amazon and Netflix. So I'm hoping I just sent in the final, the the quote unquote final draft of that to him earlier or late last week. And he was going to start showing it around. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. I hope. Thank you. (laughs) Never know. I just, you know, my thing is, it's like the one, it's like the one thing I do well relatively well i think write screenplays and and like any artist i certainly go through lots of doubts and um lack of confidence in that too sometimes i think i can't do this who am i fooling i stink um but i just keep banging stuff out for almost anybody who asks me um hoping that this one will be the one so 
you know, I have at least I'm losing track. I have at least one feature script that I'm supposed to write this summer. Um, and if there's others, it's possible there's others and I've just forgotten about them, but there's, there's definitely one that I, I said I would write. And that, that's sort of what I want to ask you too, Dave, is I want to ask you about your process about writing. Mm-hmm. So do you start off – You know, I mean I imagine you have some kind of seed idea or concept and then do you outline after that? Well, that's a really good point too. Let me actually back step. Uh, this, it's kind of strange. I'm really a – I didn't expect this it to be the – the way it was going to be, but I'm kind of a writer for hire. I'm a hired gun. People come to me and say, Hey Dave, can you write a movie about this? Can you write a movie about that? And I'm like, yes. So, you know, a guy came to me, this was a few years ago. He said, Hey, I just got hired to direct a movie. The original director was fired. I hate the script. Can you get me a new script in a week? And it, it's about a cannibal. It's about a, a uh, sorry. It's about a vegetarian who becomes a cannibal. I'm like, okay. So I wrote that. Um, and uh, you know, a few years ago, somebody said, "Hey, Dave, could you write a teenage vampire movie?" And I actually, I'm not in a position to turn down work, but I actually turned that one down. I said, "No." And he's like, "Why?" And I'm like, "Well, because I think it's been done." He's like, "Really?" Like, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a movie, this this Twilight thing that's kind of about teenage vampires. And he's like, eh, there can be another one. And uh, he's, he, he didn't beg, but somehow I wound up writing it. Um, so my thing is, just because an idea may not be completely sound, a vegetarian who becomes a cannibal or teenage vampire movie, if I'm doing my job... Um, I have to take that concept and do something good with it. So in those particular, those particular cases, I looked at it and I said, okay, this is what I have to work with. What can I do with these scenarios that will satisfy me creatively and personally? How can I make these, how, how can I tell a story that I'm interested in? in writing and interested and in watching, uh, you know, I, I, I still cling to this notion that, you know, film is a piece of art and, you know, artists should express themselves. So that's what I tried to do. I tried in those particular cases. Um, so, you know, at this point I say I've written about 45 screenplays, feature films, documentaries, short films. That's either start from scratch or rewrite or doctor or co-write based on somebody's idea of those 45 um i'd say maybe mm, uh, you know maybe five six seven might be completely original ideas coming up with ideas is hard Uh, (laughs) basically i guess what i'm saying is you tell me what you want a movie to be about i can write it You tell me to come up with an idea for a movie, I struggle. I don't struggle, but I have to think, what do I want to do a movie about? Oh, that's that's interesting. So, but, but, you know, and and it's just your whole process. And, and so out of those 40, you have about six or seven that are actually originally, you know, your pieces. So I guess my, so my next question would be once you, I guess it would be the same either way because once it's your idea or once they have what it's about, do you start outlining from there? Oh, right. Yeah. Back to the original question. Well, the cool thing is sometimes it's cool. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes they give me a treatment. Sometimes we say, Dave, can you write a screenplay? I have, you know, a seven page treatment and like a a seven page treatment. They send it to me. Boom. I sit down and write. Uh, Last year, somebody asked me to write a screenplay. They said, great. I'll send you over the treatment. They sent over a treatment. It was a paragraph. I'm like, "Uh, that's not a treatment. I now I have to come up with a story. Which I can do. Um, But in terms of the outlining process, that's a really good question because I'm really starting to feel the last couple of years that the outline, the treatment stage is kind of where the real screenwriting happens. Um, I think screenwriting involves two distinct arts. There's the storytelling, the creative storytelling part. 
think that happens in the treatment, coming up with the characters and the plot and the story and the backstory and all that. Um, then there's the mechanical arts, which is the what we we're touching on earlier, not having four page action scenes, um, writing stage directions that are succinct, but not necessarily no frills. So both parts are, are critical. Um, but for me right now, the treatment stage is, is really where I, I feel like the heavy lifting happens creatively. So th- it's basically, you know, once that heavy lifting, you know, happens, do you, I mean, I, I want to try to word this right. Do you basically brainstorm like different scenarios as you're working or do you just sort of go through like the first idea and just see where it takes you and then later on you'll go back and change something if it doesn't work? Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, I, I, I feel like I've crossed over to the dark side in that the last 10, 15 years or so, not quite 15 years, I've really come to understand, appreciate, and embrace the three-act structure model. You know, I cut my teeth in avant-garde theater, theater of the absurd, that kind of thing. And when I first heard about Sid Field's paradigm and three-act structure, I hated it. I hated the idea that you could take the, the beautiful art of cinema and essentially boil it down to a mathematical formula. Um, and I really went out of my way to write screenplays that did not follow three act structure um, with mixed results. Some very, very positive, some not as positive. Uh, So now basically when I sit down to write a screenplay, I think who's the main character? What's he like at the beginning of the movie? How does he change by the end of the movie? What are his strengths? and weaknesses, what obstacles does he need to overcome in order to get to the after in comparison to the before at the beginning of the movie. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm this guy who now has my all my important characters and my inciting incident in the first 10 pages and I have a pinch on page 28 an act break on page 30 and another act break at the end of act 2 and you know all that stuff Um, whenever possible I look for alternatives Um, stomping ground is an alternative stomping ground does not follow 3 act structure at all um, in 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 any way, shape, or form, and yet it works. Um, so, but usually, I, I first look at it through a three act structure lens. Unless I'm doing a horror film, I actually wind up getting hired to write a lot of horror films. I find horror films the characters don't need to really grow and change; they basically need to either die or not die. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much in the way of character arcs there. Very, very true. Um, uh, you know, something else, you know, I, I was talking to, to Bill today, and one other thing we touched upon um, was we talked about sh- the stru- structuring and the three act structure. And, you know, th- I mean, and, and you know, Dave, there's so many theories out there about screenwriting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of. It's sort of a, the, the the sort of mavericks, if whatever you want to call it, who sort of break all the rules. Um, and, and, and it, whenever these movies come out, they sort of – I mean like the Coen brothers, for instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I don't even know how you would put their movies sometimes like you know, a Blake Slender Save the Cat or something like that. I mean you know, Raising Arizona, they're stealing a baby. You know, uh, I don't know. The Coen brothers are just – the Coen brothers are the Coen brothers um, and they just defy all the – Odds. In fact, not, not to jump on you, but just because I happened to be watching Inside Lewin Davis yesterday, mm-hmm. um, which I love. I'd seen before. But I have this theory that I've been spouting for years that I never like movies that are edited by the director. I said in, generally, in general, movies where the director also edited, they tend to be 
indulgent and um, top heavy. And then I realized, wait a minute, the Coen brothers edit their own films and they're great. So there goes that theory. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Lewin Davis, uh, inside Lewin Davis, he actually does save the cat. Now, I don't I, know. I, I use that as an example in my class. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I don't know if that if if they were read Blake Snyder or if that is just a coincidence. Uh, I know it might be a slight. Well, I mean, the cat is so integral into the story, but yes, it it does. It it, it certainly. I mean, he saves a cat at the beginning of The Incredibles too, but um, yeah, it's it's hard not to think of save the cat in. Uh, I mean, I cracked up in the theater when I saw him saving a cat. <laughs> um, in in Lewin Davis, yeah, Lewin Davis was uh, after the first time I saw that, I kind of was like, "Wow, that that's a very interesting." Co- I don't I don't want to spoil it for anybody who haven't seen it before, but I was like, "Wow, that's an interesting Coen Brothers movie," um, because some certain things that are usually in other Coen Brothers other other Coen Brothers movies are missing. But I don't want to say what that is because right, exactly, and yet it's still so distinctively the Coen Brothers. They're just you know. They're, they're their own thing and more power to them. Exactly. And in, all, in the Coen brothers, too, the protagonist is always some kind of lovable loser. Yeah. Um, I mean – and that's that's sort of against the grain too because usually they'll teach you – an actor doesn't want to be in it. For instance, if, if the guy – or excuse me, if the protagonist isn't likable, if he's not you know uh, always – in the best position for everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm going to, um, I, I hear that on one level on another level, you know, the standard model is a, a lovable loser, somebody who's, you know, an okay guy, but beneath potential. So for instance, Peter Parker in Spider-Man is a geek, um, but we know he's going to change and, um, that kind of thing. So I think he's, I think you know. I think what's different. Uh, what if I can be so bold? You know what you were saying about the Coen Brothers films is usually they're not so lovable. You know, I mean, Lewin Davis was a particularly unpleasant character, but even the the guy in A Serious Man, you know, was not a hundred percent likable. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know, face it, um, Nick Cage in Raising Arizona also. You know, it's a comedy, so he's he's played for laughs, but but I want him over for dinner. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in, you know, in closing, Dave, we've been talking for about you know forty five minutes. Yeah. Um, I, I you know I, I know we both sort of ha- yeah, have things to do, um, so I don't want to keep you on here for too long. So, huh? you know, in closing, Dave, is you know, is there anything we haven't talked about that uh, you wanted to mention? Now, this has been pretty comprehensive. Uh, it's Well, you know, I, I do want to touch on kind of what we were talking about, the three-act structure thing, uh, though, too. Because, um, you, you know, I don't know if it came up or if you knew, you know, I, I do teach screenwriting, teach college screenwriting classes at uh, Drexel University and University of the Arts in, in Philadelphia. And I make the point that yeah, I ask my students if any of them learn to ride a bike without first using training. Wheels. Now, every now and then, there's a couple of Walsenheimers who said never use training wheels. But the fact is, most of us use training wheels for a little bit. Um, and what's this have to do with screenwriting? It's about learning the basics first, and then expanding on the form. Um, and I always challenge them. I ask them to if they can think of any artists in any uh, in, in any discipline who got to a point where they knew the basics inside out, upside down, backwards and forwards so well that they could then be groundbreaking revolutionary. So I point to Picasso. I always show them a a picture by Picasso that they don't recognize. They don't recognize it because it's realism. You don't think of Picasso doing realism, but this is a very realistic painting. Picasso could paint realism. Then he discovered Cubism or became a practitioner of Cubism. Um, Closer to their frame of reference, the Beatles. The Beatles were a cover band. And, you know, you went to see the Beatles in 1962. A Beatles concert was eight hours long. You know, and they all they did was covers of 1950s American rock songs, which are just verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And I figure, you know, a few years of doing that 
verse, chorus, verse, chorus, eight hours a day, six or seven days a week for a couple years. You know the form that a pop song takes. Uh, um, for a couple years, you revolutionize the form. So know your three-act structure. And then if you're going to try something different, you can you, you have to respond against three act structure if, if you're not it's not enough to not have structure. Um, like I said, stomping ground does not have three act structure, it has structure, it just doesn't have three act structure. Yeah, and you know it's very interesting, Dave. And uh, yeah, yeah, that is something I want to mention too. Was that you also taught you know uh, classes at Drexel in screenwriting, and um, you know, I, and I think that's a really you know great summary and uh, uh, of sort of everything we've been talking about. You know, as far as structuring, and uh, I mean, I, I honestly, you and I could be talking about hours for this stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. We still have to get together face to face. We've been talking about it for years. Yeah, it's it's. It's so odd that we live so close and we never actually have met. I know. It's great. You hooked me up with those tickets to Upstream Color too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was so funny. I remember I bought those tickets and I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll meet the uh, the director afterwards. And then like I couldn't get anybody to go. And then I had something else. Something else came up. I was like, oh, God, I hope I don't have to burn these tickets. Yeah. So yeah. I was, was glad that you could take them off my hands. No, thanks. It worked out. Cool. Um. I still never got to see that movie, by the way. I gotta check. It's on Netflix, I think. I gotta make sure to check that out. It is. It definitely is on Netflix. I, I gotta say, I was not crazy about it. Um, it's a little bit all over the place, um, especially because I loved Primer, his first film, so much. Yeah, Primer was an interesting movie um, because of how he did it um, and what he did it for, and it, and sort of the way he did it because. He did it over like the weekends, and he think he did it for like twelve thousand bucks or something. I think it's seven thousand, seven thousand, even better. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's just it's interesting, you know. It was just the idea and the concept, and you know, yeah. basically, I mean, Primer is not a three act structure by any means. No, not at all. I mean, I remember the first time I watched that movie with a group of friends. And they were like, "What the hell did we just watch?" <laughs> and I was like, "Trust me, watch it again by yourself, and you'll you'll appreciate it each time you watch it." It's one of the absolutely. Movies. I need to see it again. I liked it. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it is a it is a good movie. You'll you'll appreciate it more and more as I found. Um, but uh, so, Dave, where can people find you at online? Uh, there's a davidjgreenberg dot com. Uh, you can find me on on there or um, Twitter, Greeny Gone Wild. Um, I'd say Facebook, but there's like a million David Greenbergs on Facebook. <laughs> well, but, if you if you want, Dave, I could link to your profile in the show notes. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, I'm uh, here's you know not to, to go on and on. Somewhere in the near future, I'm going to be launching or relaunching a blog called False Climax. There is a False Climax blog, um, um, but it's expanding. Uh, a few years ago, I was hired to write a book, a um, hundred movies to watch with their kids. Long story short, the publisher went under. The book never came out, and I retained the rights to all the material. So I'm going to be publishing it. Um, I have a hundred movie reviews written, so two movies, new movie reviews a week for a year. So I already have a year's worth of material ready to go. Um, that's probably going to be going up over the summer and then going on, I'll probably keep adding to it. Not just movies to watch with their kids, but it's, a uh, movie suggestions, um, commentary questions, you know, discussion questions. So you can look up false climax too, I guess. Cool. There won't be much there. Cool, <laughs> and I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. Cool. Uh, it'll be very cool though to see you know updating that. Um, I I'm actually working on updating my site, which by the way is davebullis.com. dot um, com. Oh. So because uh, I'm never satisfied, but I think I finally found. I've been working on this in my part in my spare time, which is very rare these days. But working on getting something up, and by hopefully the next two weeks, I'll be relaunching my site. I don't like the look of it right now. Mm. Um, it's not bad. It's just not where I want it to be. I want it to right. be a little cleaner. And I want to start blogging more regularly. And um, somebody once t- somebody was telling me the other day I should start doing Twitter chats at least once a week. Um, oh, because um, not not to keep going on and on for anyone who's still listening, but uh, 
somebody I was at a I was in a social media um, webinar and one uh-huh. of the people I know was running it and she said you know recommends that anybody who has over a thousand or fifteen hundred followers should be doing a weekly Q and A and it kind of sort of got the wheels turning in my head and I realized maybe that is a good idea I, I'm not sure but I I really don't know what I have to talk about you know what I mean yeah I'm not yeah I'm I'm, I'm I'm curious about it, but I'm the same way. I kind of don't feel like I have enough to say. Here, I've, here I've just been talking almost nine, not stop for an hour. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, may, so who knows? I might do it, I might not. Um, because this podcast, I mean, it's not about me per se. I mean, well, it actually isn't. It's about the guests. But um, if I was ever going to do something, I might just do a podcast. Like way back in episode three, I did something about from just a really quick five minute. But that that's now a lost episode, so it technically doesn't exist. Like the first three episodes of this podcast technically don't exist. The reason being, the first two had like record issues, and yep. that's that's when I was in a studio doing this. Like I actually had a studio I was doing this podcast in before. Oh. And it was like, if we ever do a face to face, that's where we would do a podcast. Like that's where I would do it in. Um, uh-huh. It's just a lot of moving parts, and the third one was just me with my phone doing it, and it wasn't bad. But I was like, this isn't really worth an episode of a podcast. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, I hear, yeah. So I, that's how I got rid of. So, um, but yeah. Um, so who knows? But uh, I, I'm going to keep doing the podcast for the foreseeable future, and hopefully, hopefully by the end of this year, I'm going to be doing a Kickstarter um, awesome. for a project that I don't want to mention just yet. Because okay. uh, so, but anyways, um, Dave, I want to say thank you for coming on. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, my, you know, pleasure was all mine. And you know, uh, everyone, you can find me at davebullis.com and Twitter. It's at dave underscore bullis. And uh, Dave, let's get together soon. Absolutely. Great to talk to you. Oh, you too, buddy. Have a great night. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Find Dave at davebullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.